Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, you know, whole books have been written about this, and and in fact, whole schools of uh, psychoanalysis and and psychology. There's a, a famous uh, work by Hans Eysenck. Uh, there's a, a famous uh, a theory of ethology. Uh, there's a famous theory of mimesis to try to describe this. Uh, there's Lacan's theory of the mirror stage. You know. Which, which may be the most uh, easy to, to, to grasp, that the identification uh, is, first of all, it's at the level of real one, where the baby is uh, identified with the mother because uh, coming out of the body of the mother, the vibrational frequency uh, is the same, and there's a natural uh, love, at least in, in most situations, uh, between those beings. So it's not so much as of an identification as a merger, right? I and the mother are one, but not that you think that, obviously it's pre-language, but there is, there is that sense. And then at the point of, of uh, again, what Lacan calls the mirror stage, uh, the, the, the mother actually literally will hold the child up in her arms before a mirror and say, that's you. And the chi at the child, at that point, if it has a little bit of language already, uh, will look at that image and say, ah, that's me. And then there will be an immediate identification with that image, and that will become a self-image, along with all of the feelings that the mother has about the child that uh, she is looking at. And so it could be an image, oh, look, what a loving little boy or girl, right? Or, or what a brat or whatever, depending on the context and the feeling state uh, of that relationship. But, uh, but that will, will create the initial imaginary level of identification. And then there will be, at a, another time, a symbolic identification uh, in which not only are you uh, aware of your name and your family and your role in society and the religion that you're indoctrinated into and all of that, but that a certain ego ideal will be given to you, uh, which will be a sense of this is what you should do in life, you know? And then suddenly, you know, you're six years old, but you're already a lawyer or a doctor or you know, whatever, because mommy and daddy have said uh, that's what you're going to do, right? So uh, your, your, uh, the ego ideal, when that's installed, then uh, that creates a whole uh, uh, cascade of drives that are in accord with that ultimate goal that, that will cause the the social and uh, the uh, intellectual development to go in a certain way and not to go in other ways, right? Because if you're supposed to be an accountant, then you're not going to be encouraged to study art and drama and right things like that. Or it could be the reverse. Or And also, you will have a certain role in the family system. You'll either be the golden child, or you'll be the black sheep or the scapegoat, right? Or you'll have you'll be the forgotten middle child, or you'll, you'll be one of those uh, different roles that are assigned, and then those will be also parts of your identity that will be reflected in all your future relationships. So there are different levels and stages in which the identification is packed into you. And, and then when you're in school and, and you're uh, socializing with others and finding your place in the pack and the pecking order and who gets picked first or last for the baseball team or whatever, then that will add a, another layer to it. But all of these different uh, layers will, uh, will, will eventually uh, lead to the, whatever is the final uh, uh, adult egoic identification that will be based on the uh, mimesis or the, uh, the imitation of those who were most popular and most successful in your circle. You'll try to imitate them to get approval and to be like them. 
uh, and to, to not imitate the ones who are the losers and the unpopular, unless you have been put in that category or you are, your place in the family system was the oppositional one who always says no and I don't want to do it and I don't want that ice cream and all that. So you, you, your role may determine uh, how that identification has to play out in order to sustain itself. But eventually it becomes a set of algorithms that move robotically and you don't even control it anymore. It just happens, reflex reactions to, uh, to events and you're not even there anymore. The identification takes uh, over from your real identity. I hope that's useful. A lot of information there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you asked for it. So. No, I, yes, I did. Um, <laughs> that impulse uh, of, of the identification making that happens, you know, early birth and on through, the, there's the idea that... Uh, is, is it like a sponge, or the need for an identification that happens that quickly? Yeah, there is a need because the child is helpless uh, and it, it, uh, if it's abandoned, it will die, right? So abandonment is a terror that's almost inherent. Uh, and therefore, not to be abandoned, I need to be loved. And to be loved, I need to be approved of, mm -hmm. right? So I'm going to do whatever I know will get the approval and attention of mommy and daddy. And, right? So then uh, if they don't want you to grow up and they want you to stay at home, then that's what you're going to do. And if they want you to become the doctor who you know, makes millions, that's what you're going to do. So whatever is, is your role in the system then, because you need approval and validation from the other, that will then extend to your PhD thesis and you know everything else in life, and uh, and, and you will you will always be constantly looking for that uh, that approval and uh, those pats on the back to make you feel okay. Did me good, thank you. But that's all at the ego level. If you can reach the soul level and negate the ego, that's when you have freedom again to decide who am I in a, in a completely different context that's infinite, that's not uh, based on I am this you know, body that was born to these other two bodies that conceived me, and uh, I'm, I have to be loyal to, to that tradition that they represent, etc but you, you are now in a context where God is father and mother and you are free to explore uh, the infinite reaches of your consciousness. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Um, well, I think they're follow-ups from the questions that have already been asked. Um, so going on to that, validation and need to be thought of as good. I think so you you're not abandoned, right? I was thinking about um I, I remember that you once defined the unconscious or the reason that we create an unconscious is to be able to lie with a straight face. And um I was just like thinking about this whole thing of of needing needing to be good and having to conceal your ulterior motives and all of these sorts of things. And mm -hmm. you're really playing with, you know, a hand or both hands tied behind your back. Yeah, but you tie them yourself uh, in, in order to have another hand that's free, you see. That's the thing. A and uh, it, it's a, uh, uh, a pseudo-tie because y you, you repress uh, certain information uh, like, I actually hate my mother because I need to act like I love my mother, right? And I can't know that I actually hate her or I'm angry at her. and I want to kill her because she didn't let me go to, you know, the party with whatever, you know. So the, uh, the uh, child's uh, attitude uh, has to do that in order to be able to hold on to its sense of security. It would be too ma massively anxious if it knew that it was lying because it assumes the other knows what you're actually thinking. It takes a long time before, before the child realizes, oh, they don't know what I'm thinking, you know? <laughs> then you really start to lie and, and, and get out of control. So I th hope that answers that. Well, how to, how, to, how to get out of it, I think is the, what I was leading to. 
oh, well, how you get out of it is you realize you're, you're only really fooling yourself. And because this is all a dream, you're, you're creating uh, karmic backlashes and uh, uh, needs to, to let go of all of these levels of falseness and of uh, compensatory, uh, let's say, narcissistic greatness when you feel like you're worthless because your parents didn't give you the unconditional love you demanded from them, and, and, uh, and, and you're disappointed, and you're, you're, you're in a state of, uh, of feeling like you've been cheated by reality, you know, and... and by uh, so many other people are getting so much more than I'm getting, and why is that? In right, all of those those feelings uh, uh, create a uh, a kind of uh, a, a self hatred and a and a, uh, a negative uh, attitude about oneself, and a um, a narcissistic compensation of greatness and megalomania. To, uh, to try to, to uh, avoid that negative feeling that then creates more problems and more backlash and, and uh, more inability to relate to the other. And so eventually you realize you, you have created a, 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 a system of uh, relationality that doesn't work. It, it's, uh, it, it's a block. Uh, to any kind of uh, honest uh, intimacy. And when you reach a point in life, usually after puberty, where you need to be able to establish a relationship, you've got to be able to speak truthfully from your heart, even though you may have never done that, you know, or not since you were a baby. And, uh, and so uh, if you're going to do that, then you have to clear away the sludge of denial and, and self-hatred in order to be able to uh, attuned to someone else's, you know, issues and levels, and and not uh, have a reflex angry uh, response to someone who doesn't give you the pat on the back that you want, so that you don't destroy the relationship, but that you can actually continue to grow and reach levels of rapport uh, or semi rapport at least that that enable uh, a. Uh, a stable kind of uh, social system of friendships and, and uh, other kinds of relationships to uh, to be able to uh, to flower without constantly feeling so totally lonely that that abandonment anxiety it doesn't take over your life. If it does, then you start needing opioids and you know fentanyl and all of these things. People are and suicides happen, right? Uh, because that is the fate of the ego, because it won't get what it wants. So uh, the, um, the need to establish that, to adapt to uh, a social role that will be acceptable will, will cause you to have to uh, reconfigure the ego. And I think it ties into the innocence question, because there's at that, le at that first level in which one's playing with you know, lying with a straight face or playing with uh, an arm tied behind one's back, there's not a capacity to have access to all of one's powers and, and, and mind. And one wants to reach um, a stage in which one can tolerate all of that and, and then begin to figure things out. And I wonder if, because um, something, an idea that came to mind when you were speaking was that there has to be like a shift of of love uh, of love for even for growth that well can there, there should be there doesn't have to be and i think these days that very rarely happens it requires a, a social system that offers a rite of passage into a level of being that was not determined by the family system and and, and by the tribal order uh, and that's why there were vision quests and, and all, of, all of that, and, and why there were certain people in a society who would hold the position of a shaman or uh, some, some other magical uh, 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 kind of uh, consciousness that wasn't part of the system that someone could then uh, uh, use and learn from uh, to be able to Put the ego to death, basically, and that whole identity structure, and then discover who you are 
from your own infinite potentiality again. But that idea doesn't even occur to most people who today, uh, because they don't go through a rite of passage, they never become psychological adults. Uh, and they remain in the puer eternus, as Jung called it, right? Uh, and, and so most people are in that puerile condition in which uh, that idea of uh, letting go of the child ego, the larval state of identity to become a butterfly doesn't even occur to them. And, uh, and, and that transformation never happens. And most people never find uh, a, a guide or the kind of help needed to accomplish it. Okay, last question. Um, in regards to Carl's question, um, I don't know if identity is the right word for it, but I'm curious about this, how this functions through time, because I know you've said before that in previous yugas, there, so I'm, I'm wanting to use the word identification, but uh, there's, let's say consciousness is operating from the level of spirit, and there may be still appearances of bodies or, or whatever, even if of light, um, and, and then later of soul, one is operating from soul rather than ego. Um, is, is there identification with those things, or how, how does that work? Well, I think if you go back to Sat Yuga, right, which is that original golden age of the world, uh, everyone was identified with this absolute universal consciousness. So there's a oneness. But that oneness is now manifesting as many, but the consciousness is recognizing that everyone is a manifestation of the self. And, uh, and so there's no uh, competition or envy or desire or fear or any of that. There's, there's just a perfect natural choreography of relationality where no one gets in anyone else's way. And it's, it's just a natural thing. It's like if you ever see swarms of gnats out there, they usually don't run into each other, right? They're doing this incredibly complex dance, but it's somehow spontaneously choreographed so that it all works and, and uh, nobody falls down having crashed, you know? as they do with F-35s and things like that. So, you know, you, the, the, uh, they're much more intelligent because they're attuned. They don't have egos getting in the way. So in the golden age, there, there's no ego and not even a soul level. It's just pure unified spirit. And then in the silver age, that's lost in their soul. And then in the Dwapar Yuga, the copper age, it's a uh, sattvic ego and some soul left and then Kali Yuga's ego, with a few, you know, sages uh, salted in, but, uh, but less and less as you uh, go beyond what they call the axial age, you know, the classical period where you had Socrates and Buddha and, and uh, Lao Tzu and all of those people. And then suddenly, you know, now we're just following in the traditions that they started, but very little uh, new inspiration comes. And so uh, we're now in a desert where everyone's in their rigid little ego. And that's why it has to end. Uh, we have to break out of that.